or incorrect uh, usage of an item. One explains what it is for something to be a pawn by explaining the rules to which pawn users are subject in playing chess. All right. Now I'm arguing then that meaning is not a relation between linguistic items and non-linguistic items. And I'm arguing similarly that the objectivity of intelligibles is intersubjectivity and interlinguisticity uh, and not uh, absolute objectivity. On the other hand, I want to insist that some words would not mean what they do unless they stood in matter of factual relations uh, to uh, absolutely objective entities. Uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, for example, unless, uh, unless the word Socrates stood in some matter of factual relation to a person who lived in uh, Athens uh, 2,000 or some years ago, unless, unless names uh, stood in matter of factual relations to objects, they couldn't have the meaning they do. The meaning statements would not be true. But this doesn't mean that the word means stands for a relation. Again, the word, uh, the word yellow wouldn't have the meaning it does. In other words, uh, uh, it wouldn't function as it does unless the word yellow functioned in uh, perceptual responses, what Quine calls word-object relationships with, uh, with objective, absolutely objective entities. And yet this, again, doesn't mean that the word means uh, or the word stands for in semantics stands for a relation. All right, well now, we have then a non-relational theory of meaning and of standing for it. The next move is to apply this to the, the case of the relations, purported relation between uh, mental acts and uh, intelligible attributes. Let's uh, you know, just permit ourselves to keep this ambiguity of the Cartesian scheme versus the Strassonian scheme. And here we would have a relational theory. Uh, again, this was our three, I think, uh, where we would have an attribute, and we have a mind standing in relation to an attribute. Now, what I'm suggesting here is that we construe uh, mental acts on the analogy of linguistic items, so that to say what a mental act is about is to classify it. You see, we're already, by our account of meaning, committed to the view that to, to, to say what a person says uh, is to classify it. When you, when, you, when, you, when you say that Jones said that Tom is tall, you are, you are classifying uh, Jones's utterance in a functional way. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you quote what somebody says, of course, you're not characterizing it, or you're not classifying it in a purely functional way, because when you use direct quotes, uh, you're classifying it in terms of the linguistic materials of a certain language. But when you use indirect discourse, you are classifying it in a purely functional way. Uh, now, the suggestion here, then, is that just as when you classify the utterance uh, by quote or by indirect discourse, you are classifying it uh, functionally. Uh, so when you <coughs> say what a mental act is about, you are you are classifying it uh, in a in a functional way. So that to say Jones thought that uh, uh, that Tom is tall, you are classifying Jones's thought in a certain way. How you are classifying it with respect to how you would classify the corresponding utterance, the utterance which would express that thought. Thus, we classify mental acts in terms of how we would classify functionally the, the utterances that would express the mental act. And so, once again, we have uh, a classifying account of aboutness or meaning as contrasted with a relational theory of aboutness or meaning. Now. Uh, One, I think, uh, one final point for this morning, and that is, uh, and this is a point that's elaborated in the, in the paper on categories. That we have here the basis for 
of, um, of abstract singular terms. Because the word triangularity occurs not only in such contexts as dryadic in German stands for triangularity, but also stands in the context, for example, A exemplifies triangularity. And uh, if we follow through with the same theme, the triangularity equals the dot quote triangular, then we can see a strategy for handling the supposed relation of exemplification. This looks like a relation. It has the surface grammar uh, of a relation. And to see how, it, how its depth grammar appears, let's rewrite it uh, in terms of something that's clearly equivalent to it, namely the triangularity is true of A. To say that something exemplifies triangularity is equivalent to saying the triangularity is true of it. And this would then become the dot quote triangular is true of A. <coughs> now this is a very special use of the word A. For example, if I say wisdom is true of Socrates. This is a very special use of the word Socrates, just as in the case of Unt in German means and. We have a special use of the word and. Uh, here, I'm not using Socrates as I normally would in a, um, in a simple subject predicate sentence, as for example, Socrates is wise. I'm using it to make a sentence involving this concept of truth. And uh, the there's clearly a close relationship between wisdom is true of Socrates and Socrates, that Socrates is wise, is true. Obviously, uh, if wisdom is true of Socrates, then that Socrates is wise is true and vice versa. Now, that Socrates is wise is true, uh, according to the account that we've given of the function of the word that would come out as the dot quote Socrates is wise is true. Now, if, if uh, that Socrates is wise is true is equivalent to an expression which uh, mentions the word Socrates, this is a hint to us that in wisdom is true of Socrates, the word Socrates is also mentioned. And uh, we have another case here of a of a hidden of a hidden uh, uh, metalinguistic reference. And I will I will for the time being express this as uh, a wise concatenated with a Socrates is true. In other words, this is a way of making a truth statement which breaks up what is being characterized as true in two parts because of what one wants to do in the context. Uh, so that, uh, and, and after all, uh, we can put down this general principle here. A dot quote Socrates is wise. This, in other words, uh, the, um, here, we're, here we're, we have a functional classification uh, which applies to sentences in any language which do the Socrates is wise job. We can certainly say then, a Socrates is wise is a dot quote Socrates concatenated with a wise. And uh, the exploration of this point would take us in to an account of the subject, uh, the subject predicate connection. But now, if this is correct, then, the supposed relation of exemplification turns out to be a special use of the concept of truth. And uh, uh, we would, uh, in order then, to see whether we can get away from a relational theory of exemplification, we have to see what we can do with the concept of truth. And if it turns out that the word truth doesn't stand for a relation, then by this strategy, we would have shown that exemplifies is not a relation, and we would have gone, we would have boxed the company.